Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this lecture on 3D coordinate systems. This time it's uh, a lecture which is outside the regular curriculum of our students, but it might be interesting. It is about rotations using quaternions and um, uh, we will show that uh, rotations can be represented as two reflections and we can easily derive the rotations based on this idea. The problem is, uh, and this is the motivation behind uh, this lecture, is that in the previous lectures I proved the form of the rotation matrix. So I gave it and then we made a proof for the axis angle representation and the same for the quaternion representation. What this lecture is about, that we construct both using geometric insight on one side and using basic rules of quaternions. The idea for this um, constructive uh, way to uh, generate rotations is going back to Coxeter, uh, one of the biggest uh, geometers in the last century. He published a paper in 1946 on quaternions and reflections, which I recommend you to have a look at it. So let's have a look at um, the uh, situation. Let's assume we have a point here and we have a reflecting plane here. So this point is reflected to this point. Now we have a second pl um, plane here or in 2D a line and then we have a reflection which moves this point to here. Now we see that if we change the two lines simultaneously and leave the angle constant this point stays where it is. So it doesn't matter where these reflecting lines or planes are as long as the angle is fixed. Now if we change the angle, we can do this, we find out that the rotation changes and of course with the changed angle we have the same res result as before here and um, what you now see is that if we go back we see that we have here an angle of 46 degrees between the planes and we have here an angle of 92 degrees between P and P double prime. That means if we perform a reflection at two lines where the normals have an angle of alpha, the rotation from here to here has the angle 2 alpha. Now let's go to, two, to 3D. Let's assume we have planes here. We get, of course, the same situation as before. We have here a 3D object with four points. It's reflected here at this plane, at this mirror and a second time at this mirror, arriving at this place. Now you see that it's really a rotation from the green or yellow part to this red part. And again, of course, we have the same with the angles, that the angle between these two planes doubled yields the angle between this and this point. Why? Because this angle is the same as this one and this angle is the same as this one, so we get the double uh, angle rotation. The interesting thing is now that because if we change the um, planes simultaneously, it doesn't matter, it, has not, it would not change this uh, 3D object. That means only the angle between these two planes is of relevance. That's the first part. The second part is that we actually perform a rotation around the intersecting line of these two planes. So you have two planes and we have the intersecting line and we rotate around this intersecting line. How can we calculate the direction of this line? We have the normal, the light blue one and the red one, and we take the cross product of these two, which is a line pointing towards us outside of the screen. That means we have a positive rotation around the first normal um, uh, and cross product the second normal. 
So this is a geometric insight and now we want to formalize this using quaternions. This is just summarizing what we just observed. We have in 2D a rotation angle theta, which is double the angle, which is the angle between the lines. Um, the angle between the lines may be restricted. So if we rotate, I go back to the uh, first rotation. Let's assume we rotate this. Here we have the angle. We can re restrict this to plus minus 90 degrees, let's say from here to here. So this would be easy to because then we have actually a rotation by 180 degrees. And jointly rotating the lines doesn't change the rotation. In 3D we have the situation similar. We have the angle alpha between the planes and the rotation angle is two times. We have the angle between the lines may be restricted. And the rotation axis is the intersection line of the planes. And um, if we jointly rotate the two mirroring planes, the rotation doesn't change. Okay, I make a little bit repetition of um, how we represent quaternions. In this uh, context, we use quaternions as pairs of a scalar and a vector. And we remember that the addition is just uh, adding the two parts. And the product of the quaternions is the uh, product of the two scalar parts minus the scalar products of the two vector parts. Then we have the weighted sum of the vector parts and the cross product. Um, we need the notion of a conjugation, which means that the conjugate quaternion is nothing else than the scalar part and the negative vector part. And the norm of a quaternion is nothing else than the sum of the squared scalar part and the length of the vector part squared. And there's an inverse, which is related to the conjugation, which is nothing else than the conjugate quaternions divided by the norm squared. So this is what we, how we, what we learned um, in the previous lecture. And um, we have special quaternions. We have the one quaternion, which we could write as an upright one or one zero or just as a one. That means it has, if we multiply it, it has no effect. Then we have unit quaternions where the length of the quaternions is one. That means the sum of the squares of all elements is one. And which is very important in our context is uh, what we, is called pure quaternions. They only have a vector part. The scalar part is zero. This is um, very useful if we have 3D points, we just put the 3D coordinates into the vector part and we have a zero in the scalar part. Now, the what we want to do is the following. We want to derive the formula for reflection. So we have P reflected at this plane with the normal N to get P prime. And we will see that we can write this reflection as the quaternion product of n multiplied with p multiplied with n. And if we do the same thing a second time, we get the second, twice uh, the reflected point p double prime um, uh, as q multiplied with the given p multiplied with q. Uh, dual um, conjugate, where Q is the negative of the product of the two normals. This is what we want to derive, so that's a, so to say the program. So in order to fulfill this we need to need the rules for pure quaternions. So all the quaternions on this slide are pure quaternions, um, the given ones, the x and y, or Z, um, and um, we for, see the following. If we have the product of two pure quaternions, we have no scalar part here and we don't have the weighted sum of the products. 
So we have here the negative scalar product and here the cross product. If we take the square of two quaternions, that means we multiply a quaternion with itself, x and y are the same, so we get here the negative norm squared of x and the cross product of x and y is zero, so we have a, a real number minus the square of the norm. If we take the cube, we just multiply with x once more, we get minus this norm square multiplied with x. Now, if we take the product of conjugates, so what happens? So we have x with negative vector part, y with negative vector part, so the scalar parts are anyway zero. The dot product doesn't change because both vectors change their sign. And the same happens with x and y, so we actually get x multiplied with y. If we reverse the product, then what happens? The scalar product doesn't change, but the cross product changes its sign. So we actually get the conjugate of x multiplied with y. Now, if we have two orthogonal quaternions, that means the two vector parts are perpendicular, what happens? So let's assume we have two pure quaternions, x and z, then they are orthogonal, that means x dot z is zero. So this is zero. And then we have uh, x cross y is of course the negative of y cross x, that means in this case x cross z is minus z cross x. So if we add the two products, the products xz and the reverse product, we get zero because the scalar part is zero and the cross products cancel. Now we can specialize to unit quaternions, that means unit pure quaternions, that means the vector part is normalized to length one. And if we take this cube, uh, the square, we get x square is negative of the norm, the norm is one, so we get minus one. That means unit pure quaternions are square roots of minus one, which is interesting. And of course, if we take the third power, we just have to multiply with x, so we, the, taking the third power is leading to the negative vector x. And finally, we take the product of two unit quaternions with angle alpha. Then if x and y are units, then here we get minus the cosine of the angle. And here we get the cross product, which has length the sine of the angle and has the direction of the cross product. So this is a direction vector. The n means normalization. And of course, because cosine plus sine square is one, and this is length one, the length of this product of two unit quaternions is again a unit quaternion. So we use these relations, which are quite simple to see, uh, in the following. So let's start. We want to look how a reflection at a plane could look like. We represent points as pure quaternions. So we have the point with coordinates x, y, z, put them into this vector and generate a pure quaternion. Let's say this point here. Then we have a plane through the origin with a normalized normal. That means here this vector n is a uh, unit vector in this direction perpendicular to that plane, and we represent it with 0n, that means again as a pure quaternion, but it has length 1, so it's a pure unit quaternion. And the task is now to determine the reflected point. How can we do this? Okay, let's assume we have a point on this reflection plane. This is an arbitrary point f, and we know that these two vectors, f and n, are perpendicular. So we have orthogonal quaternions. 
And this is exactly the condition. So the product of Fn plus the product of Nf is zero. So this was this rule here for the product of orthogonal quaternions. Now we can use the constraint for the unit quaternion, which is n squared equals minus 1, and multiply this equation from right or left with n. Now what happens? We get, if you multiply from the right with n, we get here f n squared, which is minus f, plus n f n, which is plus n f n, and if we put that on the other side, we get actually a constraint f equals n multiplied with f with n. So it's just rewriting this constraint for the special case that n is a unit quaternion. Now, this is a constraint between n and f, that they are orthogonal. But we also could say this is a mapping from f to the product n f n. So we have a mapping from some point f onto some point n f n. And obviously this me means that this point f is mapped to itself. So you see the point f is mapped to itself. So of the, if we take this mapping, multiplying with from left and right with a, the same unit uh, uh, quaternion, we get a fixed points on this plane, which is normal to this normal vector. Now, we take a point G on the line of the normal. So we have a point here, which is some mu times the direction of the normal, which is a pure uh, quaternion. And we see that this maps to the opposite point. Why is that so? So we take the mu n, which is our g. It maps to n multiplied with mu n multiplied with n. We can put this scalar on the other side. We get mu times this cube of n. And this is actually minus n. That means we get minus mu n, which is minus g. So a point on a line along the normal is mapped to the reflected point with respect to this plane. And now we take an arbitrary point P and decompose it in two parts. One is in the direction of the plane and one is in the direction of the normal. And that means the point P is mapped to F minus G. That means this mapping P multiplied from left and right with the same uh, unit, pure quaternion, is a reflection at the plane perpendicular to this normal vector n. So what we have achieved is a mathematical description of the reflection. Now let's perform two reflections. The first reflection which we discussed, so from P to P prime, with this reflected plane, and we have here the normal of that plane, and the second reflection at a different plane, let's say this one, with this normal, is nothing else than m multiplied with p prime multiplied with m, or m n, which is the first part, p, and then m n m in the reverse order. And what we know from geometric insight is that what stands here is a rotation from P to P double prime. So this is the representation. And what we remember is that the description is not unique because we could choose the two planes differently. Now, let's have a look. We can rewrite this rotation from p to p double prime by observing that we have here mn and here the reverse product. So it only depends on the product of these two. Okay, we take the product of these two, choose a negative sign, why? 
because we then obtain a quaternion, which is the scalar product of n and m, not the negative scalar product, and the cross product of n cross m. And we remember that if we take the conjugate of mn, we get the product of n and m. So this nm is nothing else than the conjugate of m multiplied with n. Aha! That means the essential part is this quaternion. It's the angle between these two values and the cross product of these two vectors. That means what we uh, obtain is that this quaternion is nothing else than cosine alpha, that's the angle between n and m, and sine alpha, which is uh, the sine of the angle between the two normals, multiplied with the direction of the normal. Ah, this is, um, comes to something which we could expect. So, generally we obtain a rotation with a unit quaternion from p now to p prime around this rotation axis pointing out of the screen with angle theta is the multiplication of some point p from the left with q and from the right with the conjugate of q, assuming that q is a unit quaternion. So this is an important result, that is, the rotation can be represented with a unit quaternion. So in both cases we assume that p and p prime are pure quaternions. And now from the geometric insight we remember that the rotation angle theta is two times the angle between the two planes. So, we actually, instead of having this quaternion, we could also say it's the cosine of half the rotation angle for the scalar part and sine of the half angle between um, uh, of the rotation multiplied with the direction vector of the rotation. R is a unit uh, vector. So, this is a very important result because it now allows to interpret this quaternion in terms of the rotation properties. We have the axis r and the angle theta and we can directly generate the q. Now, if we have it with a unit quaternion, we have this expression just derived. Now, if the, quater the quaternion has general length, arbitrary length, then we have to multiply from the left with q and from the right with q power minus 1. Why? Because we have here q prime, uh, q bar, which is the conjugate, and because we have here the length and here the length once more, we have to divide by the length of the quaternion squared. That means a rotation represented with an arbitrary quaternion can be is the same as the rotation derived by some quaternion multiplied with an arbitrary factor lambda. This could be either make a unit quaternion out of it or we could take the negative value so the rotation with q and the rotation with minus q is the same rotation. So in terms of homogeneous coordinates if we interpret q as a four a, a, a two element we can multiply this element with an arbitrary factor, not zero, and still get the same rotation. So if we interpret quaternions as representing rotations, they are homogeneous entities. So what we, of course, have seen is that if we perform the rotation um, of some point P to P prime with the quaternion Q, in classical algebra, we would write it as p multiplied with the rotation matrix, depending on q. Gives our rotated point. Now, how does this rot rotation matrix, depending on q, look like? So, we have here the point p multiplied from the left with q and the right from the right with q conjugate. We assume the q is unit uh, quaternion. 
which is nothing else than the product, the triple product of this quaternion with this quaternion with this quaternion. So we see here the original quaternion, here the conjugate, and here the pure quaternion of the point. And after some steps, we arrive at the following result. You can have the look at these equations, which is uh, quite transparent. We get a zero for the scalar part of the transform point and some matrix multiplied with p. Aha! This is exactly what we want. So the rotated point is a, represented as a pure quaternion and the vector part is this matrix multiplied with p. So this is exactly the rotation matrix which is uh, caused by this unit quaternion. So we can write this down, of course, for general quaternions. So we take i plus two scalar parts multiplied with the skew symmetric matrix of the vector part plus two times the square of the skew symmetric of the vector part and normalize with the square of the norm. We can also rewrite it in this form. And um, if you then say q0 is q and the vector is, uh, has elements q1, 2, 3, we arrive at this uh, expression which we derived in the previous lecture um, uh, before. So this is actually a rotation matrix and has only quadratic elements, so only squares or product of two elements. So this is the rotation matrix if we have a unit uh, quaternion. And now we remember that Q is the cosine of the half rotation angle and the rotation um, vector multiplied with sine half the angle is the vector part of this quaternion. Now we use these classical relations from trigonometry. This is actually the form for double the angle. So we have here the single angle theta half and here the double angle that means theta and the same here for sine. And um, now we see that is the unit matrix. We have here two times Q. Q was the cosine. And um, this one, this has the length sine, so it's two cosine sine, so it's sine theta, which is here. And here we have two times the sine square, which is this one. That means we arrive at one minus cosine theta. And this is the classical axis angle form of a rotation matrix. So given the rotation vector, the direction vector, and the angle, we have here an explicit expression for the rotation matrix derived from our derivation with quaternions. So as a conclusion, what we did was to look at rotations at double reflections. The reflection with pure quaternions can be written as the product of some point with the same uh, pure normalized quaternion from left and right. And the rotation as a consequence is the point multiplied from left with Q and from the right with the conjugate. We could normalize it. And of course, if we would have a mirroring, we just would have a mapping with a negative sign. That means we reflect at the origin. And the unit quaternion with axis R and angle theta is what we have seen, the cosine of the half angle. And we know now why there is half the angle, because it's the angle between the two mirroring planes, uh, which is the causing uh, fact for the rotation. And what we derived was the axis angle representation for the rotation. And all this done was by construction. So we didn't make any proofs before, but we just used the basic rules from quaternions to uh, construct uh, this result. Um, again, I refer to this paper from Coxeter. Thank you very much for listening.